in America were given the right to vote. By 1856, every white man could vote. And in 1920, that right was extended to white women. But it wasn't until this day in 1965 that the path to the polls was cleared for black people. And that came after decades of discrimination, intimidation, murder, and the work of civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and John Lewis. They marched across the Pettus Bridge on what went down in history as Bloody Sunday. Marchers were attacked, some beaten, but eight days later, President Lyndon Bain Johnson said he would do the right thing and get a Voting Rights Act passed. The 1965 Act banned voting discrimination against anyone because of race or ethnicity and also banned literacy tests. But the struggle for equal and easy access to the polls is far from over. This map from the Brennan Center for Justice shows 18 GOP-led states with sweeping new restrictive election laws. Texas is among them for laws passed in the last two years. And right now, state GOP lawmakers are in a battle to get even stricter laws passed. Now, the Department of Justice has jumped in to sue the state of Georgia, saying their new laws disenfranchise black voters. Today, the Department of Justice is suing the state of Georgia. Our complaint alleges that recent changes to Georgia's election laws were enacted with the purpose of denying or abridging the right of black Georgians to vote on account of their race or color in violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. A chorus of discontent among black voters is growing. People don't think the Biden administration is doing enough, fast enough. Two federal bills have not made it through Congress including the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. One month ago, after meeting with civil rights leaders at the White House, Vice President Kamala Harris, who's been tasked with protecting voting rights, announced the Democratic Party would invest $25 million on voting education and access. The vice president has called protecting voting rights, quote, the fight of our lifetime. A lot is at stake here, and tonight we're asking the question, are black women the answer? We already know black women are incredible warriors in this fight. But what if we stack the deck? I want to bring in Ruby Powell, Ruby Powell Dennis. She's with Elect Black Women PAC. Ruby, when I say stack the deck, I'm talking about the idea of getting as many black women as possible into office at all levels who can help push critical reforms through. So how is your organization ramping up to help well, thank you so much for having me on. I'm here at Elect Black Women PAC. We're doing just that. We're not only making sure that Black women get access to the critical tools, resources, vendors, and partners that you need to be successful in your candidacy, but also that once our women are elected, we commit to support them the next two to four years on whatever their something next is. Um, far too often, you know, we spend, uh, we have a hyper focus on candidate training. Uh, voter education, but we actually don't talk a lot about, you know, the systems and structures that black women need access to so that once we are elected, we create, we can create the transformational change that our communities deserve. So that's where we're focusing and we're really proud to support women like India Walton and others who are running across the country and making history. But will this change come fast enough as we're looking at these restrictive voting laws already going into effect? and a, another election, midterm election, 2022, that could potentially change the balance of power? The short answer is no. Unfortunately, an analysis done by the Brookings Institute in 2018 showed that there are census tracts where black women live in the community but already are underrepresented in terms of the electorate. Places like Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, Maryland, and South Carolina are already behind the curve. And so the women who are running and looking to serve in these communities already have an uphill battle because of systemic oppression, because of systemic issues around accessing, you know, candidate resources, whether it's through the local party, et cetera, fundraising, all of these continue to be barriers. But the one thing we know to be true is that black women know how to make something happen with very few resources. And so we're confident that we'll get the change we want, but it might very well take us to the next census to get there. 
You mentioned the census that the new numbers are going to drop next week uh, and they are expected to show that this country is well on the way to being a majority minority country. How much of an impact is that going to have when it comes to redistricting and the types of policies that are discussed going forward? Well, when the legislation um, that was made by the Supreme Court to push down redistricting as a state's right, um, you know, conservatives, Republicans did a very good job of taking state legislative seats over the last 10 years. And so we are already preparing for unfair maps. Um, those who are savvy, those who are in the work for justice, for equality, are already preparing, you know, attorneys, fundraising to go ahead and fight these maps because we know that they're not going to be equitable. We know that they're going to be gerrymandered even further than what they are. And we're already seeing the outcomes. The reason that we're not seeing legislation passed in places like Tennessee is because conservatives are, have already created a supermajority, where if our leaders here left and flew to D.C., like our counterparts in Texas, Republicans can still pass legislation without Democrats being present. And so, you know, we have to continue to fight at every level. We're proud of organizations like Fair Fight that are doing their part to make sure that we are prepared to file the lawsuits. We are prepared to present alternative maps because, again, the battle is at the state legislative level. And so we are relying on Congress and our president to give us a level of protection because right now the ball is not in our court and the odds are not in our favor. Ruby, what you're talking about is the power of local engagement, community engagement, and how all politics is local. But we're also talking about how black women have uplifted most of society for most of the time that we've been a country. Are you just tired? <laughs> To say the very least, um, I am a descendant of the Deacons of Defense, who did a ton of work in terms of the civil rights movement in South Southern Louisiana. And I am hearing the same conversations that my parents talked about, our grandparents talked about at the dinner table. We are discussing it, my husband and I, at our dinner table. And my daughter, who's four years old and getting ready to enter our educational system, she's hearing these conversations. So to say I'm tired is a very polite way of saying how I actually feel. But Ruby, I appreciate what you are doing now, and I, I certainly um, will do my part uh, to support the effort to get more black women elected. Ruby Powell Dennis, thank you for joining us. And still ahead, wildfires out west are burning out of control. Next, we're li living from what is now the third largest wildfire in California's history. We'll take a look at the destruction it has left behind.